and I don't mind at all being called a black artist. If when Pearlstein and some of the others that you would call them leading white artists, and since you do not make that discrimination, just call me an American artist. Well, <clears throat> I write through the black experience again, because that's what I know. And I believe it is better for any artist to uh, use the materials with which he or she is most familiar. I'm always talking about the human condition, what it is like to be a human being, what makes us weep, what makes us laugh, what does us down, how we sometimes make it over. Um, I too feel, if I'm described as a black artist, I am black and I am a poet. Um, if I'm described as a woman artist, I am a woman and I am a writer. Um, those two phrases, however, do not completely contain me. I am other than a black woman artist. I am an American, I'm a human being, I'm a mother, I'm somebody's lover, I'm a good friend and a sister and a daughter and I'm tall and I mean, if one is going to say, why not Maya Angelou the tall writer? <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does, uh, in a way. I mean, I feel left out if there's a group of black artists or black people who, who paint or write or sculpt or dance and I'm not invited. Then I think, hey, you guys. I'm black. <laughs> right. But, um... I belong more to the black community, it must be said, than I do to any other particular community than human. The constraints of uh, overt racism uh, burden the soul. Uh, and at some point, the uh, the soul has got to, to, to be free. I don't know what that means, free, but one is certainly, one cannot be put forever into a tiny prison, uh, in, figuratively, without that prison affecting and afflicting the, uh, the buoyancy of the soul. Um, George Moses Horton, around 1850 and here in North Carolina, uh, wrote uh, to Horace Greeley, and he was a slave, Mr. Horton, and he, he said, strike the fetters from my legs and bid the vassal soar. Soar. It is. That is not to say that there aren't great writers who can live within restrictions, but usually they are, when they are self-imposed, that's one thing, but when a larger society says that because of the color of your skin, you dare not, you cannot, for one thing, have uh, the books to read, which you must, must, must read. Mm -hmm. You can't go to the museum mm -hmm. to see the paintings, which you must see. You must have them inside your, your machine. The first time I went to New York in 1952 with the scholarship to dance, to study with Pearl Freeman, I couldn't believe that there were that many black people in the world. <laughs> it was the most exciting thing. I, I mean, no white American particularly or very, very few Europeans can imagine what it is like to be a member of a visible minority. For everywhere you look, you see reflections of yourself. For us, we are always aware that we are two blacks in the room, one black in the room, five blacks in the town, ten, fifteen hundred in the... 
you're always aware when there's always the web. And I went to Harlem. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I talked to people. I would walk up to groups of people uh, <clears throat> and then just, just, just start talking. I, 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 it absolutely bowled me over. It was a, a, a kind of affirmation that it was all right to be black and to laugh and to swing my hips and uh, to love children. All the things that, that I had found to be unique in me, I found millions of people who had the same unique uh, talents and, and virtues. Harlem gave me, by the energy there, by the confluence of all those energies, gave me uh, the right to be bodacious. And I took that right and use it still today. Took it all over the world, took it to Europe, took it to Africa, took it to North Africa, and brought it to Winston-Salem. I am absolutely, utterly, unabashedly, and eternally bodacious.